Lord, welcome to our Bible study. Uh, we're glad to have you here. We are studying 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But before we jump in, I just want to say that 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is a very important chapter. It reveals what the sin that was going on within this church in Corinth was. Um, I had mentioned many times about how the church in Corinth was very carnal. And Paul told them, he called them spiritual babies. And, and I can't give you meat, I have to give you milk. Because there were things that were going on in that church that were very wicked and evil and sinful. And it seemed as though the leadership in that church was not uh, dealing with it. They were kind of ignoring it, maybe hoping it would go away. And so chapter 5 is a very important chapter because it reveals um, a little bit about what the carnality was that was going on in that church. And we're not going to get to it tonight because I don't think we're going to, to finish the whole chapter tonight. But later on in the chapter, it talks about discipline, church discipline, and how we as pastors, how we as leaders in a local church should be dealing with with problems of sin and, and things that might be happening within that local church. And so we're going to look at all of this over the next couple of weeks. But for right now, we're going to jump right into verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now, the first part of this verse is saying it is reported uh, it, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Now, notice how it says commonly. So it seems to be that this wasn't really a secret. It, this church probably had a little bit of a reputation. You know, there was probably a lot of talking about, oh, did you hear what's going on in that church? Did you hear about what's going on in this group? And so they had a reputation because it was reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about fornication. We're not going to look at all the scriptures today because we just simply won't have time to do so. But there are a couple of, of scriptures that I do uh, want to look at. And the first one, and you probably just have to turn the page to get to it, is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want to read verses 18 to 20. Three little verses here that talk a lot about fornication. And it says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man do doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and that ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So this is just a, a really good example of what the Bible has to say about fornication. And it doesn't talk about it being a, a good thing. In fact, it talks about it being a sin. And not only a sin that you commit against somebody else or a sin that you commit about, uh, against God... It's a sin that you commit against your own body. You know, we've talked about the law of sowing and reaping. And we know that if we sow in the flesh, we're going to reap corruption in the flesh. And people that sleep around a lot and commit a lot of fornication uh, tend to get sick or get STDs or, or so on and so forth. And uh, so you're sinning against your own body if you're committing fornication. But not only that, it goes on to say that your body is not your own. Your body, if you're a saved believer, is a temple of the Holy Ghost. We know that. We look at Ephesians 1 and 13 very often. That verse that talks about when we trust and we believe, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so that Spirit of God, that Holy Ghost, dwells within us. Our body is the temple of that, and it dwells within us. And it is there until uh, we die, though, until the day of redemption. And I love verse 20. It says, for you are bought with a price. 
What price was it that you were bought with? And that's the blood of Christ. Uh, the, the blood of Christ, God's own blood, that, that, that he purchased with his own blood, the church. Um, so we are to glorify God in our body, with our body. That's why I believe in living holy and living right, and why I believe in dressing modestly and, and being unlike the world, being separate from the world. I believe that because I believe that we ought to glorify God with our body. And we should glorify God uh, with our body and in our spirit, which are both God's. You know, we're only borrowing this body. It belongs to God. When we die, the body goes to the grave. And uh, at the rapture, the resurrection, our body's going to come up out of the grave. And so really, this body is, is if we're a saved believer, we're just borrowing this body. We're just using it here in our in our our temporal life. But someday we're going to exchange it uh, for a glorified body, a body like Christ's. Um, we're not going to get too deep into that today because um, uh, we got a lot to cover. But I have preached before on the glorified body, and I'd like to preach again uh, someday soon on the glorified body because it's a wonderful topic to talk about, about what it actually is. So now let's go back to our text. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's one more verse I want to look at, and I hope it's the right one that I have written here. We're going to go, go to Galatians chapter 5 and 19. Galatians 5 and 19. And I believe this is another verse that talks about fornication. 5 verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And 19, 20, 21 talks about other things that are the works of the flesh. And that is contrary to uh, verse 22 and 23, which is the fruit of the Spirit. They are the opposite. The works of the flesh are the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. And so again, uh, there's not a very high opinion given scripturally for fornication. It is evil, it is wicked, it is sinful, and not only a sin against another person or a sin against God, but a sin against their own selves, because we will reap uh, that corruption that we're, we're sowing. So back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm going to read verse 1 again. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and as such fornication, as is not so much named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So in fact, there was a, an adulterous relationship that was going on. And it says here that one should have his father's wife. So it would appear as though somebody in this church, something that was happening in this church was not only fornication, but adultery in the sense that there was somebody sleeping with his father's wife. Now, I don't believe that he was sleeping with his mother because I think it would have said mother. The fact that it said his father's wife is probably a, like a stepmother. It's probably not the mother of the person, but still, that's some pretty wicked, sinful things that, that were going on in this church. And it seemed as though, um, and, and we're going to look at this here shortly, it seemed as though the leadership in that church just kind of ignored it. They didn't deal with it. And I've been around churches a long time. I've been in church for a large chunk of my life. And I've seen what undealt with sin can do to a church. It can fester, it can create division, and it can create church splits, and it can destroy the church. And so over the next couple of weeks, when we look down... Uh, Later on in this chapter, Paul has a lot to say on discipline and how pastors and leaders ought to discipline uh, the members of the church when things like this are happening. Now, I'm hoping that this particular type of sin doesn't happen in, in churches, but I'm sure it does, and I'm sure it has. Uh, sexual sin can be quite common in church, and a good pastor, an ideal pastor, 
will uh, deal with it. And we're going to look at that a little later. Now we're going to look at verse 2. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Verse 3, For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. And so here Paul is saying, you know what, I'm not there. I'm not in your church physically. But spiritually, yeah, I'm there. And I'm going to help you deal with this. I'm going to give you some advice and some practical advice for you to deal with this sin. And that's why I love this chapter. Being a pastor, being a minister, um, not so much now because I'm running an online church here, but, but in the future if I happen to, to pastor an actual physical church building uh, where people will come, uh, this is going to be uh, how I'm going to deal with things. Uh, verse 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So here, Paul, in the, the, the verses 2 to 4, Paul is judging this sin. He's judging this sin. If we look back at verse 2, it says, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this be deed might be taken away from you. And so here's the thing. If somebody is committing sin, and it is going to destroy the church, sometimes you might need to send them away. Sometimes you might need to disfellowship somebody. Now that's an extreme uh, consequence. Obviously, being a pastor, if somebody came to me and said, we think this is something that's going on, and, and we think that there's a sin going on, and these people are involved in it, I'm going to try and gather as much information as I can, and I'm going to talk to the people involved, and, and I really want to get to the bottom of it before I start making any hasty decisions about, okay, I'm sorry, you can't be a member here. We love you, we're praying for you, we're, we're going to, you know, encourage you and, and come alongside you. And we know, you know, God can deliver you from this. And absolutely, we will pray. But until you get this fixed, you, you're not going to be invited to, to have ministry here. If you're a, a, a singer or, or you're involved in, in worship or, or, or something like that, I'm sorry you no longer fit the qualifications because you're living in sin. But, you know, we're going to pray for you and help you and, and do the best that we can to encourage you. And, and, and I believe God can deliver and, and you can repent and you can be restored, absolutely. But for right now, I, and I think that's the problem that a lot of churches have is they might not want to deal with it because it might not look good on them. You know, and, and, and so they don't want to lose people. They don't want people to leave and, and people to get offended. And so they just let these things happen. And you know, if we ignore it, maybe it'll go away. But that's not the right attitude to take. We have to deal with it quickly. Verse 5, we read it, but I want to read it again. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... Here's the thing. There are some Christian denominations and churches that believe that we can lose our salvation. If you fall into sin, if you're a saved believer and you fall into sin, your salvation that you once had can be lost. And I do not believe that. I do not agree with that. I believe that when we are saved, we are sealed until the day of redemption. So I believe what the Bible says on the topic. I don't believe that it's possible to be saved and have eternal life and then lose it. Because really, if you can lose eternal life, it, it, it's not eternal life. It's just temporary life. But we're not promised temporary life. We're, we're promised eternal life. And so I don't see how we can lose it. I, I don't see how we can be sealed with the Spirit 
that dwells within us and then, oh, lose it. It's gone. God moved out. He's got a for sale sign on the heart there and uh, he's not here anymore. No, it, it, it doesn't say that. I believe that if a Christian falls into sin, yes, they're still saved. But their, their sin is going to be judged. And oftentimes they will seek consequences and chastisement and judgment for that sin in this life. For example, if you are a carnal Christian and you smoke and drink and, and live your life loosely, number one, God has no obligation to you in your time of need. Number two, you're probably going to get sick and you're going to have a lot of unnecessary suffering in this life. Now, when you die, absolutely, yes, you're going to heaven. I, I don't believe you can, you can have salvation and lose it. But if you're not living right, if you're living in sin and you're, you're a Christian, you're a spirit-filled, born-again uh, child of God, but you're not following that spirit, absolutely, I believe that, that you will seek corruption and you will reap corruption, corruption in your flesh while you're alive. And, and, you know, your prayers might be hindered. You might not get all the blessings that you, you, you uh, would have gotten. Uh, when you get to heaven and you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you're not going to have as many rewards, uh, joyous rewards or crowns uh, when you get there because you wasted your life and didn't do much for the Lord. But yes, I do believe you're saved. We're going to leave it there today. We covered uh, verses 1 to 5. I was going to keep going a little bit, but I do want to stop there because the next verse talks about where we're going to get into disfellowshipping and, and a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. And that's going to be quite a discussion and quite a teaching. So I don't want to start it this week when we can't finish it. So we're going to look at the whole thing next week. And so uh, next week, we're going to pick up at verse 6, and we're going to look a little bit at church discipline. Some fun stuff there. And so until next time, God bless.